Welcome to Computer Science 50 in the start of week five. So this is one of those silly little things that you can connect to on the interwebs. Um, what I have used is not SSH, but a protocol called Telnet, which was kind of a precursor to SSH, whereby it's the same idea. You use a command line interface for the most part to connect to some remote computer, um, but in this case it's not encrypted, and clearly it's not necessary to encrypt something like this. But this is actually what students in this course used to use years ago instead of SSH. So I've just pulled up Putty, and I've gone to towel.blinkinlights.nl and this is an address frankly that's been up now for eight years, ten years, up and running and it's clearly by someone with way too much free time. If we had a good hour or two we could watch the entirety of Star Wars A New Hope, episode four, <laughs> implemented here with with ASCII art. We'll put a link to this on the course's website, but it's meant to motivate some of the graphical stuff you guys will be doing for problem set four. So consider that your, your trailer. Um, <laughs> so um, in problem set two, some of you took on the hacker edition, and for the hacker edition, you were not asked to implement Caesar or Visionaire, but instead uh, a variant of the DES algorithm, specifically toward an end of cracking some passwords that we had provided the hacker students uh, for that problem set. We had a few usernames that we provided really as samples, though the goal of the problem set was to write a generalized cracking program, not just one that special cases these. But we had the pointy haired boss, for instance, uh, from Dilbert, uh, whose password per one of the um, uh, cartoons on the front of the problem set was the very simple one, two, three, and most everyone who took on the hacker edition certainly got that password. We had Kite, whose password ended up just being LOL, which maybe not in an English dictionary, but certainly if you're just brute forcing all possible uh, alphabetical characters, odds are you'd come up with that pretty quickly since it's pretty short. Uh, Blaze, a reference to uh, Mr. Visionaire, his password was simply FUBAR in all caps per our own lecture in which we use that keyword. Uh, so there was embedded in that lecture a hint for that one. Uh, w. Brandis, uh, Brandis, do you, anyone know this reference? All right, this is sadly the things that take the most amount of time late at night while writing these problem sets, coming up with cultural references to embed in them. So if you ever saw the movie Sneakers with Dan Aykroyd, Robert Redford, this was the geeky guy who was hit on by the one woman in the movie. And uh, he, my voice is my password was one of the um, bits in that film. Clearly most of you have never seen this movie. I thought that was great at, at 2 a.m. Um, so his password was just my voice. The variant here being that we use some uppercase, some lowercase to kind of trick up some of the hacker students who might have just been starting with all lowercase or all uppercase. Then we had, of course, G. Costanza, which hopefully all of you know. Uh, his uh, keyword or secret word in a famed episode was, of course, Bosco was his ATM password, and so we went with that too, but tried to spice it up by using zeros for the O's instead. So that might have been caught by those hacker students who actually used some heuristics like, hmm, maybe I should try not only the letter O in all possible forms, but maybe I should occasionally substitute zero, because a lot of us, perhaps in this room, tend to substitute things that look like letters but are not, in fact, simply because it helps our own memory. Of course, if you do that and I do that and other people know we do that, well, well, that doesn't really add much to the security of it all. And so these popular crack utilities that exist today certainly try some common heuristics like that. Well, Steve Jobs, uh, S. Jobs here, we went with iPhone 3G, but with some funky capitalization, uh, certainly throwing a number in there. So odds are you didn't get that too easily, even though it's very obvious to a reader what that represents. Probably not so much to a computer. Uh, Tom Dixon from the Does It Blend series, we gave him the same password, but we used what's called the different salt. So if you read that problem set spec, there's a way of kind of spicing up the, the cipher texts by inserting some additional, um, an additional subset of a key in there. So we just used additional, uh, an additional salting mechanism, so to speak, so that the hacker students would see two different cipher texts, even though the plain text ended up being the same. And then finally, I don't know if anyone actually cracked Malin's password this year. <laughs> it's apparently a comma. Um, there, it was just this, which certainly shouldn't appear in any dictionary. You are pwned, exclamation point. <laughs> So it's funny, last year just because it was some new lingo I'd picked up for no good reason, uh, it was I think DJM FTW, FTW meaning for the win and for like three months after that the geekiest kids last semester were constantly on like their Q guide forms and the surveys and at the end of their problem sets writing for the win. Um, so uh, 
This year, perhaps the theme will be the opposite, pwned at the end of each problem set. So a couple of announcements uh, before we dive into this week. There's no handouts this week, because what I did was integrate some of the material from last week that we postponed till this week into a new set of slides that are online, but you already have the printouts thereof. Um, quiz zero. So what we decided to do, given that this semester's sections are all on Sunday, Mondays, and Tuesdays, rather than have the quiz on Monday as scheduled in this first version of the syllabus, we decided to move both quizzes to Wednesday. Wednesdays, so that the quiz zero will be next Wednesday, and similarly, will quiz one in December be on a Wednesday? This way, we can use the sections for actual uh, review opportunities. So next Wednesday, we will let you know the place, since there's very little to write on in this room. Um, the classrooms office will relocate us to one or more locations on campus, so that you guys have actually something to draw on uh, during the quiz. We will uh, provide some details on Wednesday as to what to expect, but you can certainly look at the old quizzes from last year on the course's website. Until then, and just take note: we had three quizzes instead of two last year. So we'll divide verbally or on Wednesday or in the reviews exactly where the line is between the material this year and last. But in addition to these section reviews, this Friday from 1 to 2.30 PM, uh, Lunch with David is unfortunately going to get trumped by a review session with TFs. We're going to find a location on campus. We're going to film this review session. And it will be a course-wide review session if you'd like something more than just your in-section review. So we'll let you know on Wednesday where that is. But it will be 1 to 2.30 on Friday, the idea being presumably most most of you are free, since that's when lectures otherwise would be. And finally, this walkthrough. So problem set four, if you've not yet looked at it, it's a huge amount of fun, uh, but it also takes a slightly new tact of giving you more code than we've given you before, more solution, uh, more distribution code, so to speak. So if you glance at the 34-page PDF, you will find that, uh, first of all, most of those pages are Sudoku puzzles, so don't worry so much about the length, um, including the answers at the end. But what we also provided you with for this problem set is a great deal of distribution code. Similar to what we did with Game of 15, we gave you a framework for that problem set, but in order to make this game, this problem set, all the more interesting, all the more compelling, we decided to give you yet more code, one of the motivations being to really introduce you to a very real life, uh, real world experience, which is inheriting someone else's code and actually having to modify it or build upon it. And so what you'll get out of the box when you copy our code over to your account is something like this. So starting with this problem set two, both the standard edition and the hacker edition have you SSHing to cloud.cs50.net. Process is exactly the same as nice.fas. Uh, we have a handout on the resources page of the course's website if you don't really remember how you actually got to FAS the first time. So just follow that handout, how to SSH, but sub in cloud.cs50.net for all references to nice. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm logged into the cloud as just mailin, and I'm going to go ahead and access our CS50 account, the pub directory for public, the solutions directory. So this is exactly the same path we've been using for other problem sets and run Sudoku. And you'll see that the usage information here is that you can run it in one of two modes, two levels, noob or leet, aka easy or hard. And then in brackets, there seems to be some kind of optional numeric specifier. So if I just go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to start off easy and run the noob level, what I'll get now is, dare say, a much fancier interface than we were able to give you for Game of 15. Granted, this is still ASCII art. So this is not a, a far cry from the Star Wars clips that we just saw a moment ago. But now using our cursor, I can move up down, left, right. And if you're familiar with Sudoku, you'll know that, for instance, I don't want to put the number 4 there. And so when I jot down the number 4, it does change. But as those dots suggest, that was a bad thing, because Sudoku is all about not putting similar numbers so close together in the same row, column, or box. And so our solution actually makes clearly obvious that that was a bad thing by warning you down here and also drawing the in red exactly what constraints you violated. So I'm going to hit delete and undo that. Um, um, just realize that the solution set throws in the kitchen sink. We implemented all of the optional features from the game, whereas you only have to implement one of the optional features in addition to some required. So we think you'll have great fun with this in that it's going to, one, be a lovely distraction if you want to procrastinate, either by playing your own code or uh, the solution set. But it also is very representative of our finally sort of removing some of those training wheels and taking a much bigger step into bigger, more interesting software. And that's sort of, that's certainly one of the aims of the course. So tonight's 
walkthrough at 6 p.m., normally led by Cato, but we're going to give him a break tonight so that he can catch up on his own work. I'm going to lead the walkthrough myself and walk us through the uh, distribution code. It's 600 lines of code, but it's not all that hard. And the problem set spec itself walks you through it as well. Um, but this will be filmed 6 p.m. tonight, Northwest Science B101. And this will just be um, an opportunity to take a stroll through the source code with me at the helm, um, pointing out what you should know, what you should be interesting, and where you should begin. So with all that said, any questions on anything? Anything related? Anything at all? No? All right. So where did we leave off? So last week we left off by focusing on memory and sort of our own management thereof. And we stumbled upon this rather broken piece of code. Let me go ahead and copy from our lectures directory from last week. Uh, copy 1.c. And this was a program that looked like this. And we seem to be in black and white. Let me fix one thing here. Oh, this is actually a good thing to note. Um, with respect to Sudoku, you guys are going to hopefully want to use color in the programs, if only because it makes it more interesting. Clearly, something's awry with my terminal settings here in Secure CRT. So what the problem set has you do in a footnote, if you need to, is if you go to the appropriate options menu, there's this mention of terminal here, which in general is probably best put on Linux with this box, ANSI color check, so that you actually get color. Let me go ahead and see if this makes any difference here. Still has not. Let me go ahead and run pub bin our own setup program, which might not have been run in a while. Let me go ahead and re-log in, CS50, okay, it's temp into source and copy one. There we go. Okay, so I, we had messed up our own account settings there. But here we go. So on co copy1.c last week, we had this example, which was a pretty short program. That is pretty much it, but it was broken. It did not, in fact, change a copy. It did not uh, succeed in copying a string. Why? What was the gotcha here last week? Why was this a broken program if its purpose was to make a copy of a string and capitalize just one of them? What do you got? Anything at all? Why was this broken? And I, I've realized for trial and error, so I still brought my little tablet pen. Um, we're not going to try having uh, David draw his handwriting on the screen anymore since that didn't seem to work very well. But I seem to be pretty good at drawing lines and circles. So uh, we're learning. So I stalled. Yes. Say again. Uh, can you speak up? Okay, good. So the original is changing as well because even though in this line here we're doing an assignment, which up until now has generally been a very straightforward thing. You make a copy of something by doing something, get something. But in this case, what were we actually copying in that line of code that I circled? So just the address. So remember that one of the takeaways from last week is that strings, previously called strings in the CS50 library, are now called char stars. We're kind of taking those training wheels off. And a char star implies that there's some kind of pointer involved in the representation of a string. Well, a string underneath the hood is just a bunch of characters, uh, specifically an array of characters. And arrays, we now know, are addressable only by way of what? the first, the address of the first byte in the string, right? So there's no recollection inherently of how long a string is. That's entirely up to you, with, in, with small exceptions, you the programmer, to remember how big an array is. Because a computer in C, when it passes an array around as an argument or stores it as a variable, all it's remembering is the address of that array, specifically the address of the first byte in it. So when we actually draw, when we actually do this assignment here, absolutely is S2 taking on the value that's in S1, but specifically what value is in S1? It's just an address. It's a 32-bit number that is literally telling the computer where in RAM that particular string is, or more specifically, where the first character in that string actually is. So when we then scroll down later on here and say, and claim, I am about to capitalize this thing, and then I actually do S2 bracket 0, well, S2 bracket 0 at this point in the story is identical to what other variable or S1 bracket zero, right? Because they're perfectly synonymous. So at the end of the day, when we ran this thing and did a make of copy one and actually ran copy one, say something, David, well, that 
didn't appear to reveal the bug, but if I in fact actually run this thing in lowercase like foo, then we see lowercase foo becomes foo capitalized in both cases. So how do we fix this? Like what was the proposed solution? Yeah, so if we're going to capitalize just one copy, we better make a true copy of this string. And if a string, again, by definition, is just a bunch of characters back to back to back, well, it would seem that we need to create as much memory as it takes to store that first string so as to then copy all of the original characters into that duplicated space and then only touch one copy or the other. And so we introduced this, which was copy2.c. And it wasn't all that much longer, but it did introduce this very powerful, if dangerous, function call called malloc for memory allocation. And this is powerful in that it finally gives us the ability to ma manage memory entirely ourselves, to grow our programs, to fit as much data as can physically fit in the computer, say, three gigabytes at once, once, or even more perhaps if we start using disk space, and it allows us to ask the operating system for a whole bunch of memory, but then we get to keep it. So there's no issues anymore with functions returning and stack frames disappearing, because malloc reserves memory from what type of memory, did we say? So the so-called heap. So we had that diagram that we'll come back to today, but that diagram essentially said that there's two types of memory. There's the stack, which grows upward, at least conceptually, and the heap that grows downward. That already suggests potentially a bad design decision, right? Because at some point those two might hit. But for now, we just know that our memory from malloc is going to be coming from the heap. And it stays there until we give it back. And what did we propose was one of the symptoms of not giving memory back. So the programmer forgets to call the, an, the uh, converse of malloc, and the opposite of malloc is free. What happens if you don't call free, potentially? Especially if your program's running oh, a long, long time. So it can crash your computer, it can slow it down to a crawl, because the more memory your program's consuming, obviously the less memory is available to other programs. And if you're familiar, there's this notion of virtual memory. So what is virtual memory, incidentally, so we can make this even more real? All of your computers use virtual memory. It's pretty much an option that comes turned on these days. Yeah, exactly. It's using your hard disk space as though it were RAM. Now consider that your RAM in your computer is maybe a gigabyte, two gigs, maybe four gigs, whereas your hard disk is what these days? You know, 200 gigabytes, 500 gigabytes, even a terabyte if you have a desktop drive or a, an external hard drive. So there's an order of magnitude difference there. But the upside is hard disks can store permanently a lot more information than RAM. But the problem is that if a computer's running for a long time and you're running a lot of programs and one or more of those programs there, say, is buggy and is asking for more and more memory and never giving it back while it's still running, well, your computer's not going to these days say, eh, forget it, no more programs for you, and just prevents you from running an additional program. That can happen, but for the most part, your computer instead these days takes a look at all the programs in like your task bar or in the system tray and says, you know what, which of these programs are you not using? Right? No one has instant messaged you for an hour. You clearly don't need that program resident in RAM right now. Let me actually page that, quote unquote, to disk. So virtual memory is, push, is all about taking stuff that's in RAM, moving it to your hard drive, temporarily, but the catch is that hard disks are much slower than RAM these days, right? Pretty much anything that has a moving part is unlikely to be as fast as something purely electronic, like RAM, which does not have moving parts. So the reason, or a reason your computer can slow down, simply because someone screwed up, someone made a bug when it comes to memory management, is because if you eat more and more memory, that's less memory available to other programs, other programs are then potentially going to get paged to disk to make more room for your program, or yet others, and then the process of going back and forth and back and forth to the hard disk and RAM just to deal with this, this mistake just takes time because that thing has to physically spin and get the bits back and forth. So it's sort of a very real world nuisance that derives from something potentially as simple as forgetting to free memory you have allocated. But there's another danger in malloc and in C in general. What, what, is, like the, what is the risk that we accept in mem managing our own memory in this way? What did we claim last week as possible? Right, because what is uh, a pointer? It's just an address, and that gives you the ability to go get something from memory at that address. Yeah? 
you can alter other data in memory. So because you have this power in C and C++ of grabbing pieces of information at specific addresses, well there's really no built-in constraints to stop you from saying, okay, sure, the data I'm supposed to touch is at address 1, 2, 3, 4, but because I'm being malicious, because I'm being stupid, because I'm just being careless, I'm going to go try to get the chunk of memory at address 4, 5, 6. Well, C in general is not going to stop you and therein lies a potential exploit. And on Wednesday we'll discuss some of these things potentially about how you can go about compromising systems and hacking in or cracking into programs because of mistakes people have made. But for now, let's see if we're using this okay. So I'm mallocking how much memory here? Well, it looks like I'm mallocking as many bytes as is equal to the length of S1 times the size of a char, just in case it varies based on the hardware I'm running, plus one. And recall that last week we did say that this here should actually, just to be perfectly correct, should really be in there. And why was I adding in the plus one on top of the string length? Yeah, so the null character. So that backslash zero that's got to come at the end of a string. Sterling just returns the literal length of a string so far as a human would judge it, but we need that extra byte. Otherwise, we're going to not be able to check where the end of the string is. So at this point in the story, once this line has executed, what literally is stored in S2? The ran uh, speak up. Uh, say one more time. Okay, so the ran okay, so yes, kind of. So the random zeros and ones that were there before the memory was allocated, but specifically, let's home in on S2. S2 is a pointer. It's a pointer to a char. All pointers, though, are 32 bits. So that begs the question, what is inside those 32 bits after this line of code is executed? The address of the memory we allocated. Specifically, if we just allocated, say, 10 bytes or 10 plus 1 equals 11 bytes, what we get back is the address in memory of the very first byte. And it's again up to us to remember how many bytes we actually are allowed to touch thereafter, because clearly we can touch any of that memory we want. What, in what circumstances do you think this might save our lives here? So doing S2 equals equals null and returning immediately if it does equal null. Like, why is that there, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, so a very reasonable, if infrequent, occurrence is that you've asked for just too much memory because of a bug, because your user is really pushing the limits of your program, you've asked for 10 gigabytes of memory. Well, you're not going to get that, most likely, from a computer because there are generally certain limits, and the way the computer is going to signify, uh-uh, that's way too much, is malloc quite simply is going to return null. It doesn't explicitly tell you what the limit is. You might have to play around and figure it out by trial and error. You might have to ask a system administrator. You might have to read the manual for the operator system, but in short, you can at least check if you've been returned what you asked for. So if malloc does not equal null, you're good to go because it's a valid address. And this is why I said last week that, you know, it was kind of convenient at first on the board when I was saying this is memory address zero, this is one, this is two, but the world has kind of carved out zero to have special meaning. Null in all caps is just a synonym for zero. And this is a useful thing because we have like this special sentinel value that functions can return to say, eh, something bad happened. Now there's definitely a contradiction here, right? Generally when main returns, it's good when it returns zero. So it's not necessarily a, a, a guarantee that zero signifies something good or bad. It depends. But in this case, null coming back is bad. And how do we know this? How do we know what malloc might return? Well, again, as we preach a couple of times throughout the problem set four that just went out, man is your friend. So running man followed by the function you care about will generally reveal not only helpful information about what the function does, but if you scroll down, the return value as well. And it's scrolling a bit off my screen here, but what it's saying off the screen here is that this function returns null if something fails, if there's not enough memory. So that's good to know. But let's assume for now that it doesn't fail. Oh, and another frequently asked question that came up yet again this weekend, how do you quit from man? It's just Q. Just take Q. Or when in doubt, control C. All right. So we now have at this point the following. In S2 here is the address of the chunk of memory that's been returned. Now I claimed last week that this was kind of stupid. Why? 
Yeah, it's like checking for the same thing. I, at first, I was asking, does it equal null? And I got back an answer. And now I'm just asking, does it not equal null? And I'm going to get the same but opposite answer. So we decided last week that this was a bit inefficient, or this was a bit wasteful. Certainly no reason to do that. So let's rip that out altogether, re indent that code. And now what are we doing here? So copy the string. So int n gets the string length of s1. And now I'm doing int i gets 0 up through n, and then doing this copy. And then this, did I need to do this last line here that I've circled? Is that line necessary? Yes? No? Okay, so I could have gone one step further, right? Because this is a little cryptic and arguably not necessary to add that extra line of code. That should probably suffice. Is there any circumstance under which this changed code, whereby I've changed the less than to a less than equal to, can it fail? Can bad things happen? Can bad things happen? So if it equals 0, so if the string length equals 0, that's a good question. Let's consider this case. So if string length of uh, s1 equals 0, that means i is going to go from 0 up through 0. So the loop is going to execute one time. So that means we're going to be doing this line of code no matter what. Going s2 bracket 0 gets s1 bracket 0. Will that cause the program to seg fault? Will that cause the program to seg fault? Good question. Does a string of length 0 still have a null character? Yes, it does. Otherwise, you wouldn't really be able to distinguish it from some bogus value altogether. So except for uh, really strange cases, this code's OK because we ourselves made sure that we've allocated at least one byte. So if the string length is 0, I'm still allocating one byte. That byte's only going to contain a backslash 0 because that's presumably what's at the end of S1. But if you really wanted to pick push hard on us and it's fair to do because we're going to pull the, the, um, uh, pull the uh, hood off of this function here today, get string, if there's a bug in get string whereby we ourselves are screwing up the handling of zero length strings, well then absolutely could this code crash. But let's hope not. All right, so at this point we've copied the string from S1 into S2 and so we're done with everything above that line. Now I claim I'm capitalizing the code. Turns out that for um, past problem sets, maybe Caesar and things like that, you didn't really have to do everything by hand in terms of the arithmetic, adding in capital A or subtracting it off, because there are functions like two upper and two lower. You can see these in the man pages or on that uh, C reference on the resources page of our website. So this looks like it's capitalizing how many of the characters in S2? Just the one. It does seem we're doing a sanity check here to make sure we're not going to touch a string that's not actually there. So let's go ahead and run this thing. So let's go ahead and uh, save that. Make copy two. Let's go ahead and run copy two. This string was uninteresting last time. So let's go ahead now and run it, say, on lowercase foo. And now it's correct because notice now the original is still lowercase, but the, up, the second version is in fact capitalized. But are we done with copy two? What you ask for, you must give back. And so we now start freeing both S1 and S2. But this here is a little bit of a white lie. If you're only supposed to free memory you allocated, which of these strings did you allocate? Yeah, so S2, right, with the malloc call. So here's where we've sort of been cheating for four weeks' time. So get string and other functions in the CS50 library actually allocate memory. And get string itself certainly never freeze that memory because never once have you called unget string or free on a string that you've gotten with get string. So what it's finally time to do today is to take a look at what's actually been going on in those files. So let's go ahead and take a look real quick at the following. So pub releases CS50. So finally, just as we stop using CS50's library, will we start to reveal what was going on there? So there were two files in CS50's library, one of which you were constantly including, and what it was in there. So notice this is a little dark and blue, but what you'll see is your programs get larger and you start using more. Um, libraries. Um, this is still a bit dark, but in the top left corner there, this says uh, uh, sharp symbol if ndef underscore cs50 underscore h. 
sharp define underscore CS50 underscore H. So this is what's called a macro. So you'll see this mentioned in problem set 4's PDF, whereby we use another type of macro as well. But it's very common as your programs get more and more complicated for you, for instance, to include foo.h in one of your files. But then one of your other files might also need the functions that are declared in foo.h. And so very reasonably, you yourself do a sharp include of foo.h elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere. So a large large program of yours might have half a dozen files and all of them might need and thus might include some foo.h. Well this is problematic because the sharp include mechanism really does what when you compile your code? Like what happens to the stuff that's in the .h file when you compile the .c file that's included it? Yeah, it literally does like a find and replace. Wherever your C file says include foo.h, the compiler grabs the contents of foo.h and pastes them there. So this is kind of a bad thing if now you have like six different files, all of which have sharp included some foo.h file, but now you have six copies of foo.h and you actually have code in there that's clearly by nature redundant, duplicates. And you'll start getting those annoying messages like uh, symbols do, uh, multiply defined and you'll get bad things will happen because you're trying trying to compile the same code six times for one program. So this little trick up here is sort of a way of short circuiting the inclusion process. The first line says if the following token, the special keyword underscore CS50 underscore H is not defined and def, go ahead and define it. But otherwise, if it is defined, this is kind of like a, a condition built into what's called the preprocessor of GCC, the thing that runs really before any zeros and ones get generated. For the five other files, at that point when they try to get compiled, CS50 underscore H is going to be sharp defined. And so the H file will not get included five more times. It will essentially short circuit that process. So a good trick and something to bear in mind if you too, especially for um, Sudoku, your final projects, you start using yet more .c files. So what's going on in here? So we've borrowed a few uh, other libraries, some floating point library, something related to limits. It looks like we stole the definition of a bool from a file called standard bool.h. So true and false, the, the, a bool, B-O-O-L, is not a standard data type in C. But we created it by way of this library just by borrowing a, another library that these days does come supported by GCC. So we otherwise could have done something actually like, um, do we want to do this? Yeah. So what we could have done, and I think we did do last year, is the following. We used this special keyword called enum, which is enumeration, and we very simply said uh, true, let's say true, no, we said false gets zero and true gets one. And what the enum keyword has the effect of doing is sort of declaring special keywords called false and true in this case, initializing them to that value. So it's kind of like defining a constant. You're enumerating a whole bunch of values and giving them va and a whole bunch of tokens and giving them values. But what's neat about enums is they allow you to do a lot of these kinds of things. Because what you do is specify what value the first token should take on and then you just separate all the rest with commas and then they just keep getting incremented. So true takes on one. If I actually was kind of messing around here and said something like uh, meaningless. Well, meaningless will henceforth have the value of two and so forth. So it's this kind of a neat way to declare sort of constants, but that automatically take on values. Who cares? Like why might this be useful to have values sort of automatically assigned the more and more you add to the comma separated list, do you think? Who cares? Well, we'll actually see, I'll hold that thought, we'll actually see when we get to the Sudoku code, either today or in the walkthrough, that this is actually useful when you're trying to keep track of a lot of pieces of information in a program and you yourself don't want to have to go back in and constantly change the values of some token because you decide, you know what, I need a new such token and it's kind of got to go between the first one and the second one. It'd just frankly be a real pain to have to go in and change all of the numbers just to sort of insert a new token in its given place. So this is very useful just to assign number to symbols whereby you don't care about what values they actually have. Well, let's fast forward a little bit. What's this? So it seems that there's this other keyword we've been using all along that you too can now use called type def, whereby you can create your own data types, simple data types. In this case, so simple, it's literally a synonym. But what this keyword is saying is declare the following type. A char star shall henceforth also be called 
a string. So anywhere you see string, it's as though you had written char star. Anywhere you see char star, you could write string. Now, this is kind of fluffy in this context because we're really just making a synonym for something that's otherwise a little cryptic looking. But we'll see that you can actually declare your own more sophisticated data types, data structures, starting next week using that same mechanism. As for the rest of this stuff, what are these things called when it just says return value, function name, and then parentheses and some semicolons? So the function declarations, prototypes, this just why do these things exist? Like why do we have get char and let's say get double and get float and get int and get long long, get string all defined or declared but not actually defined, not implemented in this file? What's the whole purpose of this h file? Yeah. Right, so it's this nuisance in C whereby you have to declare your functions at the beginning of your program, right? Otherwise, C is not going to realize they exist if they're only defined later in your code. But it's also useful because by way of these H files, can you write code? You can write your own library, much like we have done, and then only expose potentially the users of your code to just what the functions look like and how they're called. So there's this neat little inherent built in protection for intellectual property. You can write the C file, you can even compile it and never never show it to the world. Instead, you can just give them the H file and just say, you know what, if you sharp include this file and compile in the .o file, the uh, CS50.o file I've created, well, you can use my code, but you can't really see how it works. You can just know how it should work based on this file. So then there's also an efficiency here whereby you can factor out common functions like we have and reuse them all throughout your programs. Well, let's take a look at one such function. Let's scroll down to Let's say, uh, let's say get int. All right, so get int is about yay long. So it's not all that long because it's an int. <laughs> let's see how this works. So this is again the function that very simply asks, prompts the user with that blinking prompt for an int and then yells at them with retry if they fail to give us that. So what's happening? Well, apparently we intentionally induce an infinite loop, probably the idea being we just want to pester and pester the user ad nauseum until we get that int. It looks like just to save code, we're using our own get string function because when you type something at the keyboard, even if it looks like an int, it's really just a string, a bunch of characters. So one of our goals in life is is going to be to convert that string to an int. But it turned out that we were able to save a lot of code by using our own function because in writing get int, get float, get double, when I first wrote this, I was copying and pasting the same lines of code again and again and again and it just got stupid at some point. So I factored it out, called it get string so that we can then reuse our own code. So this is that whole uh, hierarchical decomposition. Same kind of idea coming through here. So I now am doing this because I read my own documentation for get string and get string's own comments say this function returns null if something goes wrong. If the user tries to say paste in the entire works of Shakespeare, there's not enough RAM to fit that in one string. Get string's not going to return part of Shakespeare, it's going to return null. So I have to check for that. And now here's sort of the interesting gotcha, at least with C. An int can be any one of four billion values, like negative two billion to positive two billion. And a function can only return a value or none at all. So it's either one value or no values. So clearly we need to return one value for this function, otherwise it's useless, right? The whole point is to get an int. But what would you propose we return if an error happens, right? Like if the user just doesn't give us an int and hits control D or the computer runs out of memory. Like what are the options for a function like get int, which is being called by other functions, if something goes wrong and you just can't return an int? What do you do? What could you do? Any options I'll take. Yeah. OK, so you could return zero. OK, good, but bad for what reason? OK, so now you can never get the number zero from the user. OK, so that's fine. So there's a plus and a minus. What else could you do? Yeah. <laughs> oh, much like I've done. So you can return a gigantic integer, the idea being that who in the world is ever going to type the very largest possible value, like 2 billion something is the largest possible value. So 2 to the 31 minus 1. Well, the upside of that is that now we're at least picking a number that's less common than 0. So that's probably a good thing, but what's the downside? I mean, the user can never input that number, which may or may not be a bad thing. So the pushback is, all right, fine, if you, the user really needs to input 2 billion something, what function could they use instead? 
So get double, but get double. Uh, so get double does use 64 bits, but it does return a floating point value. If we want an integer, what else should we use? Get long long. Okay, so get long long gives me a much bigger range of values, but if we continue the same argument, how are we going to signify an error in get long long? Right, it would be even larger number, right? So we just kind of push the problem off, I'll postpone it a little further, but it's kind of this inherent constraint. At least in C, when you can either return a value or return void, that is, don't return anything, you kind of have to pick for yourself a sentinel value, a special constant to return, whether it's all caps null, whether it's zero, whether it's apparently this number called int max, which we just figured out by looking through this file up here called.、Uh, It was in the h file.、Uh, Limits.h, I believe, is where int max is defined. We had to pick a number. We had to draw the line somewhere, and we decided, you know what? People using our library just are not going to be able to reliably input that big of a number. We've got to do it some other way. All right? So, what other way? Apparently, we're just punting. It's just not supported. You can't, with our code, even input 5 billion or 3 billion because it exceeds 2 billion. All right, well, let's suppose the user's not so annoying, and they actually provide us with an int that's within the valid range. Range、and we get to this point in the story. What might this line of code be doing? So the comments don't really help here. But what functions do you already know exist or have you used that convert a string to an int? A to Y, right? You might have used it in like、uh, Caesar, I think. So you might have used Caesar,、uh, in Caesar, A to Y to convert whatever key number the user types at the command line to turn it into an int. So you took argv of 1 and called A to Y on it, probably. But it's great. It works so simple, but there's kind of a downside. What does A to Y return if provided with foo or David or CS50 as, instead of a number? Returns zero. Right? So that might be fine because your program's not going to break. It's just not going to rotate the, the plain text at all. But if the spec required, which that one did not, that you actually do some error checking and check did the user type in a string or a valid number, A to I is not going to cut it. You have to do yet more work. So if you didn't, apparently the solution is going to be something called scanf or scanf. But if you didn't know that there was some function, like what else could you do to do a sanity check on argv of 1 to really check? Before A to I gets called, if you're about to pass it an actual number or something, a string that looks like a number. What's that? Yeah, so you could check that every character is a digit. And in fact, there is some, one such function called is digit, right? So you have to you know, do more work yourself. Use a for loop, while loop, whatever, and just check over the length of argv1 is this a digit? Is this a digit? Is this is a digit? And if any of those function calls return false, you just abort and you say, sorry, provide me with an int. We didn't expect as much in problem set two, but our library we decided needed to be more robust. So without dwelling too long on the minutia of this particular trick, scanf is a function that takes a string as its first argument and scans it. Sort of in the opposite way that printf does. So, printf takes format specifiers and puts stuff there for you. Well, scanf takes、uh, format specifiers and looks for stuff there to extract from the string in scanning it. So, what this line here says is you know what? Scan the string called line using this format string. So, this format string says look for a D,、uh, an integer, then look for some amount of white space, then look for a character. And where do you want to put those values? Well, here we actually. Actually, have some use for those things called pointers or pass by reference. Notice I've declared really as temporary variables an n and a c, but I'm passing them in by reference because what do you think scanf, scanf is going to put inside of n and f or n and c? Whatever actually sort of map onto those format specifiers. So if the user actually types in, say, the number 2 followed by a space followed by the letter A, well, 2 is going to end up in D and A is going to end up in C. Why would this not work if I remove these ampersands? Why is that bad? Why is that bad?
Right, so I'm giving the function values in this case, but I want the function to give me values. And the only way that a function can change some variable is if you pass it by reference, right? Because if you pass it by value, just by passing in the literal uh, or, um, variable names like we've done here, well, that's all fine and good, but the function gets copies. And yes, it can change them, but as soon as that function returns, they disappear. And that's kind of contrary to the goal here. So if I instead use the ampersand, the address of operator, like we introduced last week, what that passes Passes into scanf is not the variables n and c, but the addresses of them. And so now scanf can actually go follow the line, that arrow we drew conceptually on the board, plop in the values that are supposed to go there, like the number 2 and the letter a. And then when the function returns, they're sort of magically in those variables. And here's sort of an interesting backdoor to c that kind of contradicts the claim I made a moment ago. So in c, a function can return one value or none at all. Although it can return an array, which arguably means return multiple values. But the trick that is commonly used in C and C to return multiple values is apparently to pass in the th buckets at, by reference to the function as parameters and let the function manipulate those variables and then a sort of a implicitly return values to you. And in this way, can you return any number? Of actual variables. All right, so why am I even including percent %c if、uh, my only purpose in life is to detect a percent %d? Why might it be useful to check for an int and a character? What if the user types in and is getting a little obnoxious, like 13 space foo, right? There's an int, but then there's a word, and that's clearly not numeric only input. Well, what's going to happen is if we use this format specifier, take a guess, what's going to end up in percent %d? It's a whole int, so it's not just a digit, so 13. But what's going to end up in percent %c? So if I typed in 13 foo, it's going to be 13 in, D, in n and f. In C. And so what scanf is going to return is the following. Well, let's check.、Uh, man s scanf. Notice that it's apparently related to a whole bunch of other functions similarly named, but let's scroll down to return values. Again, oh, here's all the format specifiers. So this is pretty much copied and pasted from printf's man page. Let's scroll down.、Uh, conforming to return value. These functions return the number of input items successfully assigned. All right, what does that mean? It just means if we passed in n and c and maybe a whole laundry list of other variables, what this function returns is how many of those variables actually got assigned values. So, what do we hope the return value is if the purpose of this function is to just get an int? One. And so, what we do is say if scanf of the line equals equals one, that's great. Throw the line away and return n. Because C is empty, there was no superfluous character input at the command line. But if instead scanf returns zero, that's really bad. If it returns two, that's just as bad. So then go ahead, free the line, free up the memory, yell at the user with retry, and then because of the loop, go ahead and repeat this infinite loop again and again and again. So not only have we figured out a way to sort of have built in error checking mechanisms, we can also now return a value by first grabbing it by way of this pass by reference and then return the variable we defined. Yeah. What if the char, so what if the user said foo and foo? So if the user had typed in foo and foo, This would actually return, what would it return? So this is not going to get assigned. I、uh, what would that do? I think it's going to return zero because it starts matching from the beginning of the format string. And maybe one of the TFs can correct me if I'm wrong, but、uh, where's one? So what I think it will return there is.、Uh, Zero, because it's going to fail to match the first format specifier. And so it's, it's short circuits at that point doing the pattern matching. And so it doesn't even get to the point of the percent %c. And incidentally, the white space that's in this string, this can actually signify one or, zero,、uh, one or more spaces. So that's just a useful trick so that you can actually have as much white space in there as necessary. So that's something, too, we're taking advantage of. So this has been perhaps one of the quietest moments in the lecture hall today here. So let's go ahead and take our two minute sanity break, and then we'll return with more on this. OK,、uh, you know, it's a tough lecture when even your computer goes to sleep. All right, so、uh, we're back, as is the computer.、Uh, any questions about the library tricks that we just introduced? We'll look at one other function, but any questions on getInt? No? All right, so 
I'm going to cut some corners, very reasonably so, and say that get float, get double, and uh, what's the other one? Get long, long. They're pretty much the same. In fact, we can quickly glance at them. There's no need really to walk through them. Let's go to, oh, there we go. Let's go to uh, pub, releases, CS50, CS50.c, and just glance at, let's say, get char. So get char, pretty much the same code, except I'm going to check for a char followed by a char, because now the goal is to check did the user provide one and only one char. So same exact trick there called C1 and C2. That's sort of the end of that function. Get double. Only difference here is I'm using a different format string for a double. It's kind of like a long float. And by looking it up in the manual, I discovered that the format specifier there is LF, so percent LF, followed by a character, lets me detect a double just as easily as I was able to detect an int. And notice I'm just returning a different maximum, um, maximum return value here. So there's this number double max, which is pretty big, and that's my sentinel value. So one interesting question, though, is how does the user know to actually check for that value? Well, this is why you guys have been reading man pages, and this is why we document our own code only by reading, frankly, the documentation of a function, such as the comments above this function here, would you even know what to check for? And if you don't check for those things, it's in, uh, generally dangerous to call that function for reasons we've looked at. Get float, what's the, per oh, what's the format specifier probably going to be? Yes, that's right, percent %f, pretty easy that one. And then finally, get long, long, any takers? What format specifier? LLD, so long, long, decimal, so in that case, all right? All right, so that's it for those four functions. Now let's look at getString, because it actually uses these neat tricks we've been looking at with malloc. All right, so let's take a look. It looks like getString operates by first declaring a string buffer that is initialized to null. So let's take off one training wheel. This is really char star, so that's just like saying give me a pointer to which character, but you know what, I'm not going to use it yet. But I want to know what it is by default so that I don't assume that some big bogus value there is actually legitimate, so I'm going to initialize it to null. So I can check for myself whether or not that's legit. Let's go back to the original there. All right, capacity of buffer. Well, we'll see what this is going to be useful for. But in general, we're going to need to remember how big our buffer of memory is. Because the reason here is, suppose I initialize my buffer to size, what's reasonable? 16. That's pretty big, right? If all we're doing is typing in short words, people's names, 16 characters is pretty reasonable. But what happens if the user pastes in a 17th character or an 18th character, and we've only allocated a buffer of some size 16? Well, what could your function do? What's an option? What's that? Increase the buffer. So you can increase the buffer, right? Probably how could we do that? Well, if an array, if a, if a string is an array of characters and you need more of them, what could you do sort of conceptually? You could just kind of ask, can I go over here, right? Can I fit more down here? The catch is that's not always possible because if the computer's been doing other things, if you're, you yourself have been allocating memory elsewhere, you might have sort of boxed yourself in to a 16 character width. So what you might have to do actually is say, mm, 16 wasn't enough. Can you give me another chunk of memory that's bigger than this one, but that's maybe over here? Then what am I going to have to do? Yeah, like copy everything down. Now I have extra space in the second one, but then I need to call what? Free on the first one, lest I be sucking up memory that I no longer even need. So that's what capacity refers to, is how many characters we could put in the buffer, whereas n henceforth is going to refer to the number of characters that are actually in the buffer. And here's another keyword we haven't used so much. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory, but what does it mean if I specify that an int is not only an int, but it's unsigned? Why is that useful? What's that? Yeah, you get one extra bit, which might not seem like a lot, but one bit gives you how many more ints that are non-negative? Twice as many, right? So out of one bit, can you get two billion more positive integers, give or take? And so in this case, when capacity only makes sense conceptually in being positive or non-negative, similarly should n only be non-negative, why bother wasting two billion possible values by just wasting them on an int or by wasting them on a negative value? So if you know in advance you don't care about uh, negative numbers, just make your values unsigned by prefixing int and even other values with unsigned. All right, well now we need a little 
character to store, an,、uh, we need a variable to store a character. And you'll actually see this in problem set four. When we get a character from the user calling a function called getCH, getChar, well, it actually doesn't return a char, oddly enough, it returns an int. Like, why in the world would it be useful to represent characters with ints if all you care about is getting characters? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's that same trick before when we propose let's just use, use、uh, get long long if we really need that biggest possible value. If you want to support ASCII, and ASCII has at least extended ASCII, 256 possible values, all of which are legit. Some are a little weird looking, and if you try printing them, it'll just print some weird garbage often, but they are well defined, and they, are, they do exist on ASCIItable.com. You can see what they're supposed to be. Well, this is problematic. If you want to get any of 256 possible values from the user, but you simultaneously Simultaneously, need to deal with errors. You kind of need the ability to return any of 257 variables or values, which is kind of a problem when a char generally is just 8 bits or 1 byte or 256 possible values. So, a common trick in C is you actually use a variable that's larger than the one you actually care about so that you actually have some room to return various error conditions or at least one error condition. Well, let's see how this now works. Well, it looks like we're using a loop, and now we're using a new function called fgetc. And this is because many of the functions in C that deal with strings are by nature dangerous. And we'll look at this more closely on Wednesday, whereby with certain functions that don't check how big the buffers are, how long the arrays are, you can very easily crash your program or subject it to exploit. But fgetc very nicely. Only grabs one character at a time. And if there's no more characters to get, it returns a special sentinel value called end of file, EOF. So when I was simulating that control D last week with my keyboard, what that was sending is EOF. That's like saying, there is nothing more here. Go ahead and do whatever it is you do function with this special value. It's as though you ran out of input, you ran out of sp-、uh, bits in the file you're reading. So I'm going to read into a character,、uh, a variable called C. The next character from what might this be? Standard in? Well, it turns out that there's at least two streams in the context of any program standard in, which means stuff from the keyboard, and standard out, which means stuff to the screen. So anytime you've been calling printf, that stuff has been being printed to the default stream, which is called standard out. So in fact, all this time, when you type something like print, printf, hello world, That's actually equivalent to another function call called fprintf standard out, comma, hello, hello world. So this is useful because there's yet another stream, and you'll see this in problem set four. Turns out there's also something called standard error, so that your program can not only spit out useful messages that the user should care about, but can also spit out, sort of through a backdoor mechanism, Error messages that you, the user, might not care about, but maybe need to go to a log file or get written somewhere special. So, in short, by having different directions that characters can be printed to, at least more savvy users can do different things with the output. But in reality, at least for this course, anytime you print a standard error, odds are it's just going to end up dumped on the user's screen because di- by default, standard out and standard error go to the same place, to your terminal window. But this is a useful trick nonetheless. But when it comes to keyboard input, we need to be explicit with getc. Calling、uh, standard in,、uh, passing in standard in as the argument. This is one of these neat you know, syntactic tricks. I could have put this on a separate line, but I thought it would look cooler to actually just wrap it in parentheses and then simultaneously not only get that character, but also check that that character is not equal to the new line character. And then go ahead and check in turn that the character is not EOF. So, this is one big w- way of saying in one line of code get a character, check that it's not equal to backslash n, and that it's not equal to EOF. Because in either of those conditions, at least for CS50's library, if the user hit enter and that was it, or they hit control D, we have no more string to get. We've read all the characters. But otherwise, if we read in a character like f from foo, let's go ahead and do the following. If the number of characters in the buffer plus one is greater than the capacity of that buffer conceptually, what do we need to do? Need to grow the buffer, right? If, if we have n characters in the buffer and we add one, and that's going to push us over literally the capacity of the buffer, problem. We need to allocate more memory. So, how do we do this? Well, it looks like we took the following approach, but many design options were possible. If the capacity is zero, which by default it was, 
go ahead and initialize capacity to this constant. So again, by convention, things in all caps are generally constants. What was that? Well, let's scroll way up and take a look. Ah, capacity by default. I didn't choose 16. I instead chose 128. So looks like down here, I'm saying if capacity equals zero, initialize little capacity to 128. Else if, and now it's a little fancy, else if the capacity currently is less than or equal to the unsigned int maximum divided by two, go ahead and, oh, that's interesting. Wow, that's been buggy for a month. <laughs> Double the size of the buffer. All right, so we were more, in, turns out we were, less efficiently growing your buffer sizes than we thought. Uh, so uh, this is what, version 1.1.2 of the CS50 library? There will soon be a 1.1.3. Um, so if the capacity is less than half of, what is this probably referring to? Yeah, unsigned int max, which is probably what, roughly? Yeah, so it's four billion something. If the current capacity is less than half, the m biggest possible int we can express with 32 bits, well then we're good. We can still double the size of our buffer and still have the ability to address every one of those bytes. But again, in a 32-bit machine, which many machines still are, if you only have 32 bits, that means you can literally label only four billion or so bytes of RAM. So if you have already exceeded half as much as the largest possible value, if you're already at a value of like 3 billion and you try to double that to get 6 billion characters in your buffer, well that's all fine and good, but you're not going to be able to address the last 2 gigabytes worth of characters. If you ask for 6, you're only going to be able to talk about or get to 4 billion of those, giga, uh, 4 billion of those bytes or 4 gigabytes because you just can't count high enough. And this is why these days many of the computers you guys are now buying are 64-bit computers. This is useful because the world now needs or now wants more than say 4 gigabytes of RAM among other things. All right, so let's go ahead and check. So if the capacity is less than half of the maximum, go ahead then and double the capacity. All right, else we're kind of out of luck. At that point, if you are so close to the maximum int size, you just can't address the memory anymore, you know what, we decided to give up. We're going to free the buffer with whatever it is. We're going to go ahead and return null, and then that's it, forget string. But, but if we were able to double the capacity, or at least initialize it to 128, what can we do? Well, let's see. It looks like we're calling, uh, str let's see, realloc. So it looks like this is a cousin of malloc that kind of does what you might imagine. It reallocates memory. What are we doing? So reallocate the buffer, called buffer, and initialize it now to the new capacity times the size of a character. So whatever it is, uh, 256, 1024 times 1 for most computers, which is the size of a char, go ahead and reallocate it. Now, what do you think realloc might do, which is kind of clever, which motivated our using it instead of just malloc? And the hint is, sort of pick up where this story left off. Like why is, what might realloc be doing that's intelligent? Yeah. So it, maybe it's doing the free for you. And in fact, that is one possibility. If you've kind of boxed yourself into a, into a corner whereby there was only 16 bytes free in the first place and now you're asking for more, well, what realloc will do is everything we proposed earlier. Call malloc again, make sure it didn't return null, copy everything from old to new, free old, and then return new. But if realloc realizes, hey, you know what, there's actually a whole bunch of memory still over here that the user has not used for some other purpose, it's actually a lot more efficient for the operating system to say, you know what, keep what you've got, just go now into, extend yourself into this free space. So realloc will actually return the same exact pointer that you handed it. But you can now assume that the length of this array, this buffer, is longer. Now why do I say it's more efficient to just grow the original buffer than to create that new one? What are you saving? What are you saving? What's that? You don't have to copy. Yeah, well, for 16 bytes, big deal. But if it is like a really long paragraph, and if it is one work of Shakespeare that you're trying to grow uh, more space for, not a good thing if you have to copy every one of several megabytes or several gigabytes. So realloc is certainly an optimization there. We could re-implement it ourselves and just do some kind of check using malloc and checking the return value. And if it doesn't fit, well, maybe we could sort of roll this ourselves. But it helps here to use the operating system so that it figures out which of the memory is actually 
actually available. But if no more memory is available for us and we get back null, we have to give up. So we free the buffer, we return null, and otherwise we go ahead and retain whatever temporary variable was returned. But notice what we're doing at this very last line. Right? It's very easy to sort of lose track of the story. At this point, after jumping through all those hoops to grow the buffer if necessary, the only purpose of this iteration of this big loop was to do what? Add one more character to the buffer. So get string works by iterating over whatever the user has typed in, but with this big while loop, getting one character at a time, plopping one character down, another, 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 and then if it eventually says, mm, I don't have enough room for this, then it does take a moment's pause, double the size of the buffer, copy from old to new if necessary, and then it plugs in that character that otherwise wouldn't fit. Yeah. Ah, really good question. So why am I doubling the size of the buffer at each step with this line anytime we bump up against the limit rather than just doing a plus one? Arguments for or against? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of an optimization. It, it's an educated guess, but the idea is that if I'm growing it now, I'm going to say odds are the user's got at least one more character for me, in which case I don't want to have to bother the operating system yet again for more memory, not so much because it's, you know, a nuisance, but because it's expensive. Asking the operating system for more money, uh, for more, asking the operating system for more, <laughs> confusing my metaphors, more memory um, takes time. Um, and you end up incurring a computational cost. So the fewer times you can ask for memory, the better off you are. So the downside though, of course, in doubling your buffer size is what potentially? You got way more memory than you need, right? Maybe not initially if you're going from one to two to four to eight, but when you start going from a thousand to two thousand to four thousand to eight thousand, you're growing exponentially the buffer, which means it's getting, it's sort of gaining steam as you go. That's good though if you've got a huge amount of text to read in. It's wasteful though if you have uh, much less than that. So actually one of the things we do at the very end, albeit at a computational cost, is we check if uh, we do the following. So we check what actually is the size of n. We then ourselves manually malloc enough space for n plus 1 for the null character at the end times the size of the char. We then use this function called stir n copy, which copies n characters from source to destination, from buffer to minimal. Then we free that buffer, which might very well be way bigger than it needs to be. Then we terminate the new string that we've created to be the exact size and then we return that actual buffer. So we actually, in the end of the day, throw away all of the hard work we've done, all of the buffers that we've grown and grown and grown so that we can shrink down the memory we return to you just because we decided to this design decision, it feels better to actually return only as much memory as you need instead of more than it. So in addition on Wednesday to looking at file I.O., we're going to motivate the discussion in forensics. As you know, problem set five, due a couple of weeks hence, is going to have you recover some photos that I will be taking this afternoon on campus uh, that I will then proceed to accidentally delete. Part of that problem set two will have you not only recover those photos, but have you identify the identifiable but non-obvious locations, persons, or things that we're going to photograph for you. And in addition to that, we're going to simulate from yesteryear that little red cellophane, cellophane piece of plastic that you would get in like a cereal box and then if you held it over a secret reddish pattern, it would reveal some secret message. Well, you're going to reveal that secret message writing some code. So more on that Wednesday. <laughs>